Welcome to a webinar organized by the EU-funded IMPRESS project, focusing on finding ways to produce sustainable chemicals and materials. Our webinar is titled Conceptual Process Design of an Optimized and Integrated Biorefinery. My name is Dani, and I will lead you through this webinar. The IMPRESS project was launched in September 2019, and it aims to create a new hybrid biorefinery process. It means researching and combining selected key technologies and using them to refine renewable resources, such as forestry and agricultural residues, into multiple sustainable chemicals and materials that can replace fossil-based products. The Press Project Consortium consists of 10 outstanding partners from all around Europe and is led by Vantium in the Netherlands. In our first webinar, we introduced the IMPRESS consortium, concept, and a bigger chain reaction that it is a part of. In our second webinar, we gave a closer look at new high-value plant-based products resulting from the IMPRESS project. The third webinar focused on sustainability and life cycle assessment. If you missed our previous webinars, you can find the recordings on our homepages. In our fourth webinar today, you will hear insights on conceptual process design. The webinar is divided into two parts. The first part is about conceptual design of downstream biorefining process using structured methods and tools, presented by Hank Fleming from PDC. The second part is conceptual design and techno-economic evaluation of membrane and adsorption techniques for sugar, de-ashing, and the acidification presented by Puya Hawawala and Monique Woon from Lentec and Wei Zhao from PDC. The floor is yours, Hank. Hello, and welcome to the Impress webinar. My name is Hank Fleming, and I will give an introduction to the conceptual design of downstream biorefining processes using structured methods and special tools for conceptual design. I work with Process Design Center, or in short, PDC, who is the IMPRESS partner responsible for the design, integration, and optimization of the IMPRESS biorefining concept, as well as for the evaluation of the techno-economic feasibility of the Finding concept. First, I will shortly introduce PDC. PDC supports the process industry to arrive at new and improved processes with a smaller carbon footprint, but also energy and water footprint. We do this using disruptive process technology, proving able to generate capital and operating cost savings of up to 50%. Our key expertise includes conceptual process design, process integration and optimization, and techno-economic analysis. Currently, more than half of our turnover is in bio-based and circular process development. For more information, please visit our website as indicated here. What is conceptual process design? What do people consider when they talk about conceptual process design, or in short, CPD. Firstly, conceptual design is the very first phase of design in which drawings or solid models are the dominant tools and products. Secondly, description of how a new product will work and meet it, its performance requirements. Conceptual design deals with the selection of a series of processing steps and their integration to form a complete manufacturing system. And finally, the conceptual design phase is the initial phase of research and involves the intellectual process of developing a research idea into a realistic and appropriate design. In summary, conceptual process design boils down to filling the question mark between raw materials and products as indicated in this block scheme. But why is it so important to put attention to conceptual design? Well, if you consider the trajectory from R&D 
all the way to commissioning the production plant, conceptual design typically represents only a small portion of the total project time and cost. However, since there are still high degrees of freedom to make changes to the design, the cost reduction opportunity is much higher than in later phases, when there are only limited opportunities to make design changes and improvements typically come from optimizing the design. Another way of looking at the important role of conceptual design is to consider the scale up from bench scale to pilot demo, pre-commercial plant, and finally the industrial plant. Especially in the pilot and demonstration phase, the spending increases, leading to the so-called value of death, where it's still uncertain if finally there will be a business success. This value of death is often difficult to pass because it's not easy to convince management or investors to spend money on demonstrating the developed technology. With conceptual process design, you have the possibility to design a full-scale integrated process concept already in an early stage of development. This has two impacts. On the one hand, it provides valuable feedback to the ongoing R&D. But on the other hand, it also provides an outlook to the techno-economic feasibility and sustainability impacts of the final process. This knowledge will not only help persuade management or investors to proceed, but also defines the route for scale-up. In short, CPD helps crossing the valley of death. To prove the impact of structured CPD, here you see a plot with results of PDC projects, which had a state-of-the-art reference. On the x-axis is plotted the saving in capital cost of the plant, and on the y-axis, the saving in operating cost expressed here in energy. Normally, investments are needed to save energy, here indicated as a negative saving. Examples are heat integration options found with energy pinch technology, or the building of a cogeneration unit to generate heat and power. But with CPD, it's possible to realize capital and operating cost savings at the same time. Typical process redesign uh, savings uh, realized by PDC are 20 to 50% in capital and up to 70% in energy. The ultimate saving we have put in this graph comes from Eastman, who did a conceptual redesign of their methyl acetate process, where they intensified the whole process in one single reactive distillation column. Savings by conceptual redesign are generally achieved by step changes. And this is why there is a certain threshold, also indicated in this graph, of about 20%. If the achieved saving is too low, it often does not weigh out against the risk of introducing process changes. But how is CPD done? Well, there are several ways. And traditionally, uh, it's often a sequential process whereby the most important unit operation, often the reactor, is designed first. The rest of the design is an evolutionary process based on experience, existing designs, company practices, and engineering judgment. However, also structured methods exist for CPD that allow to follow an integrated approach on multiple design levels and use tools and methods based on fundamentals, numerics, engineering heuristics, which are rules of thumb. The development and use of structured methods for CPD started in the 1960s with the introduction of the computers. Over the years, more complex methods that require more computational power were developed. Here, some of the most important methods are listed. The empirical method is based on a trial and error approach to reach the next step. Decomposition helps to split the complex design job into smaller pieces until you reach a level where a solution is known or can be developed. Branch and bound is a method where a tree of design options is created 
but only those branches with the lowest cost are followed until a solution is found. Another approach is to develop a superstructure of the process. In this superstructure, all options are implemented in parallel or consecutive sequences by solving uh, the module using mixed integer linear programming the optimum design can be found. But as you can expect, it takes quite some effort to develop and solve the model. The hierarchical method helps addressing the designs on a different level, and the heuristic numeric method adopts a combination of numerical methods and engineering rules of thumb. Those methods will be explained in the next slides. The quite recent development is process design by AI machine learning. Using big data, the system learns from previous designs. And finally, a combination of these methods is also possible using heuristics, for instance, for the pre-selection of unit operations that are finally embedded in a superstructure that can be solved. The hierarchical approach considers the designs at several levels. On an input-output level, a black box model creates an overview of the in and outgoing streams, and this is often helpful to calculate initial economics, such as product feedstock margin. A level deeper is the task level. This task level considers what steps are needed in the process, such as reaction, separation, temperature, and pressure change, but also recycles. In this way, the mass balance can be generated. The next level in the process flow sheet is unit operation. Um, often, process simulation software is used to determine the operating conditions and validate the mass and energy balance. The final step is integration and optimization of the process, for example, with respect to energy. When dealing with conceptual process design, the task and flow sheet level are mainly considered in an iterative way moving up and down in the hierarchy. The heuristic numeric method, which PDC adopts in its processing system, uses a combination of engineering expert knowledge rules and calculation methods. Heuristics are basically rules of thumb. They provide engineering expert knowledge over a wide solution space and are applicable in data lean environments such that it helps to reduce design efforts. Often it's sufficient to only use qualitative information. Validation of technical, economic, and environmental viability of the process concept is often still needed. This can be done, for example, by process simulation, development of economic models, life cycle assessment, but also by experiments done by partners, such as it is done in the IMPRESS project. At the next slide, I will tell a bit more about ProSim. PDC uses heuristic numeric methods, which have been implemented in the AI tool ProSim, which stands for Process Synthesis. It comprises expert systems for reaction, separation, process intensification, flow sheet optimization, and support tools and connections. In this slide, you see an overview. Prosim is a German-Dutch development that started in the 1980s. With the help of many experts of different fields, more than 300 men years were invested in the system. More recently, Prosim membranes and Prosim water have been developed, and we are working on the user interface. And when this is done, we intend to make Prosim membranes publicly available for you, such that you can apply the conceptual design tool, tool for yourself. If you compare the different CPD methods, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. The amount of data required is particularly high for superstructures, where models are needed or all alternatives embedded in it. However, with simpler methods, there is the risk of missing out valuable options and that designer preferences prevail. On the other hand, with more complex methods, the complexity and effort that's needed increase. Finally, the models differ in options to create early-stage results. 
At PDC, we prefer the heuristic numeric method because it provides a good compromise of all these design aspects. Now to the um, design of separation steps. Conceptual design of separation steps involves technical technology selection. When doing so, it's good to consider the basic separation principles and complexity of each technology. In this pyramid, the complexity of the separation process increases going from top to bottom. For example, phase separation by decanting to liquid phases is much easier than affinity separation using chromatography. Therefore, it's important to consider the technologies in order of complexity. And furthermore, it's often uh, uh, sufficient to assess the feasibility of alternatives first at a higher level before more precise calculations or design efforts are done. Now to impress, in the biorefining of cellulosic biomass, many different separation steps are needed requiring different kinds of technology. Block scheme on this slide represents the impress by refining process that is under development. It considers the production of lignin, hemicellulose sugars and glucose using Avancium's Dawn technology and downstream separations and conversions to lignin products, xylitol, fodder yeast and glycols with Amsterdam. Avancium's ray technology. In each steps and uh, between steps, different separation technologies are being applied depending on the complexity of separation. For example, extractive distillation is applied to separate close boiling components. Chromatography and crystallization are used for purifying compounds that cannot be easily vaporized. But also more simple separations like evaporation, condensation and filtration are applied in the process. Besides the selection and design of separation steps, it's also important that all process steps and unit operations are well integrated and that the overall process is optimized. Therefore, optimizing the resource, energy and water balance is an essential element of CPD. In Impress, we encountered several challenges when combining the different processes. Examples are the required purification of Dawn sugars for the application in the ray technology and the application of Dawn liquid lignin for nanoparticles production, where modification in both the, the Dawn process and in the uh, LMP process were required. Process integration and optimization is also important because it has substantial impact on cost and sustainability. Without heat integration or heat recovery, it may the energy cost may become excessively high. Without proper recovery of, of auxiliaries like HCL in Impress, there is a high impact on raw materials, waste treatment, and product specification. Finally, residual streams like wastewater and off-gas detention. This may require the development of additional process steps for treatment of these uh, waste streams and recovery of valuable matter. It may be thought that energy optimization studies can be postponed to later process design phases. However, we consider it also important in CPD. Why? First of all, it's important to realize that design decisions are made on economics and the environmental impact. Without spending time on energy optimization, the impacts may become unacceptably high. Design and operating conditions can have a big impact on the utility demand, and there may be a big difference between design alternatives concerning the options for heat integration or energy savings. Furthermore, during CPD, you still have a lot of options to look for energy optimization much more than you have once the process concept is fixed. How to consider energy optimization? Well, take into account the possibilities for energy integration already when you select equipment for unit operations. Select operating conditions that allow maximum heat integration potential. 
look for the possibilities of heat pump and perform heat integration, for example, by energy pinch technology. It's not needed to do it to the full extent, as long as the main heat integration potential is covered. This slide shows an example of a heat pump. By compressing overhead vapors to a pressure at which they condense at a higher temperature, it's possible to drive the reboiler. In practice, this works best when the temperature difference between reboiler and condenser is small. The second box shows the implementation of a feed effluent exchanger. If you would not consider it the duty of the feed heater and effluent cooler, I consider it and add it up to the operating cost. Final example is that by changing the pressure of the second column, heat integration with the reboiler of the first column becomes possible. This saves energy. But there are things to be checked, such as the separation efficiency, which may become worse. Also, the cost of the second column will go up because it operates at a higher pressure. And you need to consider if the utility for the reboiler of the second column is still available at a higher temperature. Now about water management. With increasing environmental tension and many water streams going around in a biorefinery, attention to water management is recommended. A recent method developed under Prosin is a heuristic numeric system that addresses options for increasing the water efficiency and reducing cost. Rather than only uh, considering wastewater treatment and reuse, the system in investigates options for decentralized treatment of processed water streams, thereby reducing water intake. This is done by internal water recirculation and increasing the options for recovery of valuable substances. Here you see an example of another biorefining project, BioCat Polymers, where different scenarios and streams were investigated. The first water stream mainly contains organics and electrochemical oxidation was selected, yielding 100% water recovery. Two similar streams containing ions, but with low amounts of organics were combined and treated with reverse osmosis or nanofiltration. Reverse osmosis was preferred and 64% water recovery could be achieved. Another stream containing a high total dissolved solids amount was treated by selecting eutectic freeze crystallization and 90% water could be recovered. In summary, conceptual design is an activity covering many multiple tasks in one, like reactor and separation selection and design, management of recycles and site streams, process optimization, economic feasibility and environmental impact assessment. Therefore, conceptual design requires a multidisciplinary approach involving CPD tools, CPD experts who work in close collaboration with R&D and engineering, but also with business development and management. With such an approach and involvement from multiple parties, it's possible to develop an optimum process concept. And the IMPRESS project is a good example thereof. I would like to thank you for your participation in this webinar. If you like to get more information about the IMPRESS project, please visit our project website indicated here. Likewise, more information about PDC can be found on processdesigncenter.com. Here you find ways to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hank. Next, we'll move to part two. We are in Munich from Antec, please. Um, welcome everyone to this part of the IMPRESS webinar on the conceptual design and techno-economic evaluation of membrane and absorption technology for sugar de-ashing or de-acidification. My name is Monique, and I am presenting with my colleague Pooja on behalf of the IMPRESS team at Lentec. So for this webinar, uh, we as Lentec are collaborating and supporting PDC on the conceptual design of membrane technology for two purposes. The first purpose is to de-ash de or de-acidify sugar streams. 
and the second purpose is to concentrate the sugar streams. At Lentec, we performed studies which included lab and pilot trials to obtain sufficient information to come up with a conceptual design. Now, those topics will be covered by my colleague Pujam, but before that, I would like to give you a short introduction to our focus. The overall goal of IMPRESS is to turn second generation biomass into efficient sugar production for green chemicals and other value products, such as bioplastics, as a replacement to fossil based products. And because we're using second generation biomass, like wood or woody plants, we can avoid competing with resources originating from the food chain making it a sustainable way of producing alternatives to fossil-based products. So to get bioplastics or biochemicals, um, the second generation biomass undergoes several processing steps, of which hydrolysis is one of the first. In the hydrolysis process, the sugars are released by breaking down the carbohydrate chains using dilute or very concentrated acids. Now, within Impress, hydrochloric acid is used to break down the biomass to obtain a C5, C6 sugar solution first and a C6 sugar stream after a second hydrolysis step. And since these sugars originate from a second generation biomass, they can also be labeled as 2G sugars. Now, after hydrolysis, um, the sugars, they will be sent downstream to a fermentation step in which microorganisms metabolize the sugars into alcohols and then proceed to other post-processing steps. So what are the characteristics of such sugar solutions? Now on this slide, uh, three different samples are depicted, which we received and processed during our lab trials. And visually, the solutions are very different. The color changes from very dark to brown to even colorless, and its composition is also very different, as the sugar content for one sample could be very low, while the other sample can have a very high sugar content. And the same goes for the hydrochloric acid content. Now, this can be due to many reasons, but mostly due to the type of feedstock and its pretreatment. So with this in mind, you can imagine that if sugar solutions with fluctuations in quality were to be fed to a fermentation tank, guaranteeing a stable process is impossible. Moreover, the microorganisms in the fermentation tank could be very sensitive to our acid content or if neutralization is desired prior, they can also be very sensitive to high ash content. Therefore, while producing high sugar yields is desired, it is also important to consider the remaining acid in the hydrolysate because it can negatively affect the fermentation process. And this brings us to Lentex focus between the hydrolysis and the fermentation steps. On one hand, removing the acid, or if the acid is neutralized, it will be the ash that needs to be removed. And on the other hand, uh, if required, a concentration step can be introduced to increase the sugar concentration. Now, there are two conventional technologies that are used to tackle these issues for deacidification or deashing. Ion exchange is widely used. And to concentrate liquids, the use of evaporation is quite common. Even though these technologies are very mature, there are major drawbacks associated with these options in relation to sustainability. Ion exchange resins consume a lot of water and chemicals and produces equal amounts of waste streams. Evaporation requires a lot of thermal energy and good heat exchange capabilities or waste heat to achieve high energy efficiencies. Now, in the scope of making the road to bioplastics and biochemicals more sustainable and introducing novel technologies that are already on demonstration scale, 
we identified two memory technologies as alternatives. We identified electrodialysis, or ED, as an alternative to ion exchange resin. And for preparation, we identified nanofiltration, NF, or reverse osmosis, RO, as an alternative to evaporation. And in the upcoming slides, I will explain the basic principles of these membrane technologies. So first, electrodialysis. Um, electrodialysis is an electrically driven membrane process that uses selective semi-permeable membranes to move charged compounds from one side to the other under the influence of an electric potential. In practical sense, an electrodialysis module consists of the electrodes at both ends, and in between exists the electrodialysis stack. This stack includes alternating anion and cation exchange membranes through which the transfer of charged compounds occur. Using electrodialysis to de-ash or deacidify the sugar stream works on the principle that charged compounds or ions are mobile, while sugar molecules are not. So as the solution passes through the electrodialysis stack, the cations and the anions are transported towards the so-called concentrate channels, while the sugar remains in the so-called diluent channels. And hence, the final product is a sugar stream from which the ions are removed. Common applications of electrodialysis are, for example, in di dairy industry for demineralization of various streams, or, for example, in the mining industry to concentrate brine. So nanofiltration and reverse osmosis, they are categorized as membrane filtration, which is a pressure-driven membrane technology um, that can separate particles of different sizes and characteristics from water by the use of pressure and specially designed membrane uh, with different pore sizes. Nanofiltration has a pore size range of approximately 1 to 10 nanometers, and is therefore able to reject divalent ions and organic molecules up to a certain molecular weight. Reverse osmosis has a pore size range of less than one nanometer, and that means they can reject monovalent, even monovalent ions and small-sized organic molecules. Using memory filtration to concentrate the sugar stream, uh, works on the principle that the sugar molecules are large enough to be rejected by the membrane and only lets water through. Common applications of nanofiltration are separation of ions in water or wastewater streams for recycling or recovery of valuable products. And reverse osmosis is commonly applied for water recovery or concentrating brines. So the purpose of this slide is to summarize the pros and cons of each technology for the purposes sugar deashing or deacidification on the left and concentrating uh, of sugar streams on the right. So if we start with ion exchange resin, ion exchange is a very suitable technology for feed streams that have low ionic concentrations and can achieve even lower concentrations in the PPP range. However, if the ionic feed concentrations are high, the resin bed is quickly exhausted and therefore requires more frequent cleaning, meaning that the high chemical and water usage increases too. And of course, the amount of waste stream that is generated follows the same trend. Electrodialysis, on the other hand, handles high ionic feed concentrations very well and requires less chemicals and water which also means lower waste stream production. Evaporation is known to consume a lot of energy if no waste heat is available and is therefore quite location restricting if energy consumption is important to consider. And if you compare thermal driven systems to pressure driven systems, 
the energy consumption for membrane filtration is relatively low. However, there are some drawbacks with regards to membrane filtration. For example, the high sensitivity to feed composition in terms of scaling or pH of the feed solution. Also, membrane filtration requires frequent cleaning to avoid organic fouling, whilst this type of fouling does not really affect the process of evaporation much. So, now that we have mapped out the alternative technologies to conventional options for deassaying or desidification of sugar streams and concentrating these sugars, Puja will take over um, to tell you more about our study findings and, of course, the conceptual design. The sugar solutions can be achieved using electrodialysis. To further concentrate the sugar solutions, which is deashed or deacidified, membrane filtration technology can be used, such as nanofiltration. However, upon the experimental results conducted from the Lentex studies, it has been found out that the nanofiltration techno technology could not achieve the desired sugar concentrations. Therefore, another technology was used, such as reverse osmosis. Therefore, from now onwards, the membrane filtration will be replaced with reverse osmosis. Coming to the process development, now that we have identified the technologies that can help in acid or salt removal and of water removal, this is the overall layout that has been identified. To start with, the ED feed, which consists of low sugar, and high salinity um, is subjected to the electrodialysis in the diluate chamber. Adjacent to the diluate chamber follows the concentrate chamber. The input for this is the tap water, which is also called as the makeup water. Once the salt or the acid is removed, the ED feed now becomes ED diluate. This means that the sugar content remains intact. However, the salinity drops drastically. The salinity or the salts or the acid is transferred to the adjacent chamber, which is the concentrate chamber. The chamber, the stream four, which is now called as the brine, is full of salt ions from the feed stream. The stream 2, which is the ED diluate, is now subjected to reverse osmosis to concentrate from low sugar to high sugar. Upon reverse osmosis, again two streams are produced, which is the RO permeate, which does not have any sugar and no ions present. However, the RO concentrate has high sugar and lower salinity. This is now the desired product. It is important to now determine the key performance indicators. What actually are key performance indicators? They are defined as quantifiable measure of performance over time for specific objective for each technology. This means for electrodialysis, which involves the salt or the acid removal, and reverse osmosis, which involves the water removal in a way helping us concentrate the sugar solution. The first and the foremost important KPI for electrodialysis is ion removal. This means that the ions, uh, it determines how much ions are removed from the untreated feed solution to the treated feed solution. This, the second one, is the sugar loss to the concentrate. Sometimes there, there can be sugar losses to the concentrate, which is undesired to the process. Therefore, it's important to know if the, pro, if the, in the, if the sugar is being lost in the process of de 
acidifying or de-ashing the sugar solution. Third is the energy consumption. Since this is also an electrically driven system and process, it is important to be able to quantify the energy consumed to achieve a desired ion removal. The fourth is the water consumption. Like we previously saw, there is uh, water required for the water makeup of the concentrate. Therefore, it's important to determine how much water is consumed in able to be able to achieve the desired ion removal. The fifth is the chemical consumption. Sometimes, due to the nature of the stream, there can be a requirement of the addition of of a base or an acid to neutralize the feed solution. For reverse osmosis, the first goes as the sugar concentration. In IMPRESS project, we are using reverse osmosis to concentrate the sugar. Therefore, it's the first and the foremost KPI for reverse osmosis to determine the end sugar con concentration in the desired product. The second is the sugar loss to the per minute, which is also equally important because this is undesired in the process of concentrating the sugar solution. The third, which is interdependent on the first one, is the water recovery. The fourth is the energy consumed. Again, since this is a pressure-driven system which indirectly is dependent on electricity, it is important to understand and know how much energy is consumed in kilowatt per hour, kilowatt hour per meter cube of sugar solution to concentrate from X concentration to Y concentration. First in line is electrodialysis, which is basically the salt or the acid remover. The results that were obtained were, first, based on the KPI of ion removal, greater than 99% ions were removed from stream 1 to stream 2. Second, the sugar loss to the concentrate, meaning the passage of the sugar from stream 1 to stream 4. Less than 1% of sugar losses were found in the whole process of deionizing or deacidification of the sugar solution via electrodialysis. In the process of do, in process of removing the ions, around 15 kilowatt hour per cubic meter of the sugar solution was the energy consumed. Then comes the water consumption. That means the amount of water that was used in the stream three. From the pilot studies, it was identified that the amount of water, which is also called as the makeup water used, can be up to two times less than the initial volume of the stream one. In addition, to be able to de-ash or de-acidify the sugar solution, there were no chemicals used which would drive the process. Moving forward to reverse osmosis, which was the step to concentrate the sugars. It was found out that the sugar solution from stream two were able to concentrate up to eight to 10 times more in stream five. This was this was found out to be the concentration which was desired in the impress project. In, a, in concentrating the sugar solution up to 10 times, there was no sugar loss from the feed stream to the permeate stream, which is the stream six. And the whole process of concentrating the sugar solution consumed an energy of around 2 kilowatt hour per cubic meter of solution. 
after achieving the results, it is now time to define the mode of configuration in which the technologies will be operated. For electrodialysis, the first one is the batch process. On the right, you can see that the feed solution is fed to the feed tank and which in return goes to the feed pump to the ED system. The de-ashed product is again fed, is recirculated to the feed tank one. This process keeps uh, happening until the feed tank has achieved the product solution with the desired de-ash concentration of the sugar solution. The, the advantage of this is the advantage of this process is first that it is a sim that first it is a simple design and it is not continuous. However, the downside is that that it is not efficient when the when the feed solution is being discharged from the feed tank. In addition to this, it is also not efficient when uh, when the tank sizes have to be larger for the commercial plants. The second is the sequence batch. In this system, you can see that the feed solution is fed to the feed tank one and feed tank two. How the system works is as follows. First, the feed solution from feed tank one is pumped to the ED stack and this is then returned back to the feed tank one. This process of recirculating the sugar uh, and to the uh, ED system uh, is done until the concentration of the ions um, is achieved to the desired target. Once this is achieved, the feed tank two is now pumping the feed solution to the ED system. When the solution is being pumped to the ED system in order to de-ash the so feed solution, it is in process mode. When the feed solution is completely de-ashed to the desired concentration, it is in discharge mode. This means that the product is now being discharged while the other tank is in the process mode. This, in general, is a very effective system um, and a process to operate for commercial plants. This not only helps in um, in a higher flexibility and efficiency, but also helps in continuous operation of the system. However, the downside is first that it has a very high complexity in terms of control, and it requires multiple tanks to be able to operate. The third is the one way through. In this process and mode, configuration, the feed solution from the feed tank is pumped to multiple electrodialysis tank. The, the, the process of operating this in general is, is easy. However, you require multiple ED stacks which can add up to the cost of the capital investment. Second, it is not only uh, a simple concept, but it can also be ran in a continuous mode. This also requires a lower footprint, but in, on the other hand, it has a lower flexibility. For pressure-driven membranes in commercial plants, Different flow configurations are adapted depending on the feed water characteristics and the water recoveries required. The most popular one is the multi-stage or the Christmas tree configuration. In this configuration, on the left hand side, you can see that the feed water is pumped using a high pressure pump to the first stage. In each stage, the membrane and the pressure vessels are aligned parallel to the flow of the feed and the concentrate. 
the upon filtration the permeate from the first stage and the second stage is cumulatively collected into a common permeate line whereas the concentrate from the first stage becomes the feed for the second stage and so forth and so on this is also called as concentrate staging the objective of this configuration is first to maintain similar flow per vessel through the length of the system and second to maintain the flow within the limits of the membrane element the advantage of this configuration is first to have a highly purified permeate and second to have increased water recoveries this is because that the, the concentrate from each stage is becomes the feed and is being treated for the next stage so forth and so on however the disadvantage for this configuration is that there is a build up over the membrane surface over time this is because of relatively low cross flow over the membranes reverse osmosis is a multi stage with booster pump in this configuration as you can see there are multiple recirculation pumps for each um, for each stage the the feed water is fed to the membrane uh, using a feed pump and a re recirculation pump is used before the membrane the uh, the upon filtration the permeate is continuously produced from each stage and cumulatively collected in a single permeate line whereas the concentrate flows back flows uh, partially uh, to the next stage and partially is recirculated using the recirculation pump the added advantage of the recirculation pump is it provides an added cross flow over the membrane which helps to minimize local uh, concentration polarization and minimize the organic fouling this not only helps in this but it provides the the the, the turbulent conditions required during filtration as you must have seen that there is an optional booster pump the booster pump is required um, to compensate for the delta pressure which is lost over the membrane the whole design can be divided into three parts deashing polishing and concentrating the ED can be used to deacidify or deash the bulk ions from the sugar solution. In the scheme on the left, as you can see, that the feed is treated in a sequential batch process, while the concentrate is operated in a feed and bleed operation mode. This is done to minimize the water consumption used which will be uh, you, which will be a spent brine and second it is done so that there is enough ec or the electrical conductivity gradient between the ed diluent and the ed concentrate once the bulk deashing is achieved there there could be a desire to further lower the ash concentration from the feed sugar solution. This can be achieved using an additional step, in this case, an ion exchange. Once the sugar solution has reached desired ash concentration, it can be, it can be concentrated using reverse osmosis. Based on our findings, we developed a conceptual design to be able to deash and concentrate the sugar solutions for downstream processing. However, it is important to also reflect on the readiness of this technology of these technologies for this application. This can be defined using a technology readiness level. 
It is basically a measurement tool which assesses the maturity of a technology for a particular process, in this case, ED and reverse osmosis. It can be seen that ED and RO both stand at a technology readiness level of five, which suggests that these technologies have been validated in a relevant environment. However, to increase the readiness level, it first needs to have been needs a demonstration of a prototype in a relevant environment, which requires enough work already. Last but not the least, the take home messages from the whole study suggest that the combination of ED and RO is successful and suitable to de ash and concentrate the sugar streams. Second, ED is efficient to remove only the bulk ions which are present in the sugar solution. It can be followed by a polishing step. To run the whole process, low chemicals or almost no chemicals were used to run the process. Finally, the combination of ED and RO can be a suitable alternative to the conventional ion exchange and the evaporation technologies. However, as we saw that the technology readiness level is still five, there need, it needs to increase its TRL level to be able to compete against the conventional choice. Thank you for your attention. And for more information, you can visit the links below. Thank you, Puya and Monique. Our next presenter is Wei Zhao from PDC. Please go ahead, Wei. Hello, everyone. My name is Wei Zhao. In this part, I will present you membrane and adsorption technology developed in Impress product to remove the ash and acid from a sugar solution. In this presentation, I will present you the status of the sugar from down process, the proposed uh, concept to remove them, the detailed description of this process, and the techno-economic evaluation of it. At last, we'll have some discussions. From the dome process developed in the impress, we produce the sugar solution. It uh, contains about 15% sugar mass base. It also contains each cell which causes the pH value below one. It also contains ashes from the biomass uh, feedstock. There are also some uh, impurity present in the stream in the organic form. The presence of ash and acids in these sh uh, sugar streams will make the sugar purities below specification. If we use the sugar solution as a feedstock for other chemicals, this presence of acid and ash will make the downstream process very complex. To handle the acid, it uh, requires a special materials for the equipment, which one bring extra cost. If catalyst is used for the downstream reaction, the ash and acid also deteriorate the catalyst performance. For example, the catalyst will have a shorter lifetime the selectivity to the desired products are decreased, and then we have to introduce extra separation unit to purify the desired products. At the end, it will bring the economics to a negative way. To remove the ash and acid, conventionally, an exchange uh, technology is used in practice. It's very efficient to remove uh, the acid and the ash if the process is operated appropriately. But it's also challenging if there's too much acid or ash present in the feed stream. Because of too much acid or ash in the feedstock and the resins used will be saturated very easily. So if we have frequently regenerated the resins, which one makes the process operability is lost. The resin used uh, is can be permanently regenerated, so it cannot be run on long term. 
the operating pitch value uh, addressed is for strong acid caches between 4 and 14. For weak acid caches between 6 and 15, 14. For the strong base anise is between 0 and 9. For the weak uh, base anise between 0 and 7. Another technology developed in this product is electrodialysis. It can effectively separate the ends without phase changes or regeneration with the agents. Pressure can also be used to intensify this process to concentrate the solution to a higher level, for example, 20%. However, it's difficult to yield the complete removal because at a low concentration, the conductivity is low. The feed water also has to be pre-treated to prevent the ED stacks falling. Elaborate controls are required for ED, and to keep the system at the optimal condition can also be difficult. Look at the advantage and the disadvantage of these two technologies. It's logic to lead to the target technology in this product. It combines the electrodialysis and the N exchange. To investigate this combined technology, we take the N exchange technology as a benchmark, which one is the scenario A. In scenario A, the sugar solution is the pre-neutralized and then send it to the N, N exchange units. For N exchange units, there's no sugar loss is assumed if it's uh, operated properly. But the dilution effect is well considered. For the target technology, the ED and the exchange combination, there's the two scenarios uh, investigated. Scenario B, the sugar solution is first neutralized and then sent to the electrodialysis and an exchange. For scenario C, the sugar solution is directly handled in electrodialysis units. The optimal sugar solution is neutralized and then sent to the end exchange. For all these scenarios, we assume it's run continuously. If the units all set up is run and batchwise, several units all set up will be employed in parallel to make the process uh, continuous. The so waste water from uh, all these scenarios is neutralized before it's be signed to the waste water treatment. On this slide, you can see the PFD of scenario A. The sugar solution is first neutralized and then send it to the catching exchange column first and then to the any exchange column to remove the ash and the acid. At the end, we get the sugar solution without the acid or ash. The waste water from the regeneration of an exchange is neutralized by calcium dihydroxide and send it to the wastewater treatment. For scenario B, the sugar solution is neutralized as well first before sending it to the electrodialysis. At electrodialysis, most of the ashes is removed in the wastewater. The obtained the sugar solution is sent to the cation exchange column and any exchange column. The wastewater from electrodialysis and from the any exchange columns are combined as scenario A, neutralized and sent to the wastewater treatment. Scenario C, the sugar solution is not neutralized, but directly sent to the electrodialysis to separate the, most of the acid and ash. The sugar solution obtained is neutralized afterwards before it was uh, it is sent to the catching exchange and any exchange. All the waste water again the, uh, as the same, uh, scenario B is combined and neutralized and sent to the waste water treatment. Next, we will look at the techno-economic uh, situation of different uh, scenarios. On this slide, you can see that the equipment numbers on the left and the in cost on the right. If we look at the equipment numbers, you can see that B and C, these two scenarios, is very similar. 
first scenario A have much more caching column and any columns. If we look at the cost as the uh, taking scenario C as a reference, which one is set one, you can see that B is uh, quite similar compared to C, but it uses uh, more sodium hydroxide. It also you, is, um, have some uh, storage vessels has to be considered. Compared to scenario C, the A does have uh, much more expensive uh, caching columns because of the uh, more column numbers and also bigger column size. At the end, you can see that scenario A have uh, invested about 20% more for the equipment. On this slide, you can see the capex of the different scenarios. We take the equipment cost of C as a reference, which one is set one. You can see that the, for the scenario C, the capex about uh, 2.26. And the first scenario C is very similar, about 5% more is 2.36. But the first scenario A is 2.97. It's about 30% more than the scenario C. On this slide, you can see the consumable and the utilities. Again, we take scenario C as a reference. You can see that uh, all of these scenarios consume the acid, sodium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, water, and energy. Compared to scenario C, B consume more sodium hydroxide, but less water and energy, because after neutralization, e electrodialysis is easier to be operated with higher efficiency. However, scenario A, it consumes much, much more acid and the sodium hydroxide. At the end, we got the cost we have to pay to purify the sugar solutions. You can see that scenario B and C is very similar. It's almost the same. The difference is, the difference is negligible, but scenario A, we have to pay much, much more to get a pure sugar solution. So now let's discuss the results. Uh, you can see from previous slides that the N exchange technology to treat the high concentration acid or ash is economically not feasible. Technically, it's also challenging because the high concentration is difficult to run on the resin. And the dilution effect, you can also see it on the uh, figures here. Due to the frequent regeneration, the sugar concentration will drop stepwise until 40%. The combined technology, the electrodialysis and exchange to treat the same sugar solutions, technically is feasible. Economically, it's preferable. If you see the sugar concentration, you can see that the ED can increase the sugar solution concentration a little bit. After the N exchange and the N exchange, the concentration will drop back to the normal original concentration. So this combined technology do not negatively influence the sugar concentration. So between the scenarios B and C, B has a bit, uh, larger capex, but a lower o opex. So if they take into consideration both, the B and C, there's no obvious difference. Okay, that's all I present for this uh, ED and exchange technology for sugar purification to remove the ash and acid. If you have any questions, please contact us. We are very glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Wei, and thank you all for joining our webinar. This was the fourth part of our webinar series recordings of previous webinars can be found from our home pages. Make sure to watch our other videos as well. Stay up to date with the Impress website on social media channels and remember to sign up for our free online course, The Future of Biorefining. See the link below.